Welcome back. By popular request, I'm going to talk about my, my own work uh, in the form of an intellectual biography, tell you something about why I became interested in the subject of international relations theory and what I've done over the decades to satisfy my curiosity. In due course, I will also be making videos about some of my books, so I will just be referring to them uh, en passant in this uh, talk. Uh, I begin with an interest in international relations, which arose uh, directly out of my own uh, childhood in World War II. Um, being Jewish, being from Europe initially, being a refugee adopted by an American family in the United States, um, I grew up interested in finding out why, why people were trying to kill me, uh, why World War II had happened, uh, what might I do as a scholar to learn more about these conflicts to prevent horrors from happening to other people and other children. Uh, that's been my motivation uh, throughout my career. Um, it hasn't waned. Uh, if anything, it's become more intense uh, given the state of the world, alas. Um, I grew up in New York City, in Forest Hills, in Queens, uh, bedroom uh, community. Uh, I went to school, started school in the aftermath of World War II. Um, I found school not to my liking. It was too authoritarian, boring. I couldn't do what I wanted, work at my own pace. Uh, my dissatisfaction with it only increased uh, in the course of the years, especially in high school. Uh, I would play hooky, that is an American slang term which means uh, cutting, cutting classes. Instead I would go to the New York Public Library where I had access to books from all over the world, uh, musical scores. I remember taking out Mahler's symphonies, uh, autograph symphonies on which he had made notes about how they should be performed. The New York Public Library had uh, almost a complete collection of the stamps of the world, which uh, you could look at. They were mounted in glass cases. Uh, there were Audubon prints of birds, uh, anything to your heart desires. I was like a kid in a candy shop and fascinated all the more by knowledge that in the stacks uh, below the library in the caverns of Manhattan, there were young men and women on bicycles uh, going back and forth among the hundreds of miles of uh, passageways through the stacks to collect books for people to read. I also spent time at the Marshall Chess Club, which was a great pleasure, and one day was even beaten very handily by a somewhat younger player who, uh, <laughs> whose name turned out to be Bobby Fischer. So, no shame in losing uh, to him. I went to the University of Chicago, entered in the late 50s, spanned the late 50s and the early 60s. Uh, it was uh, a joy and a sense of liberation from high school, which was during the McCarthy period, uh, so even more rigid than might otherwise have been the case. I had the good fortune to study with some of the best minds in my field. Uh, I began work with uh, Herman Feiner, who was a Romanian-British uh, expert in comparative politics. I studied with Hans Morgenthau. I became his research assistant. Uh, later he became my colleague at City College. We became friends. I ordered courses with Hannah Arendt and Leo Strauss. I studied uh, ancient Greek philosophy with Richard McCune, one of the leading authorities on Aristotle. Uh, modern art with Joshua Taylor, who 
left uh, a year or two later to become the director of the National Gallery in Washington, anthropology with Saul Tax, and I took freshman English composition from Saul Bellow. Uh, Chicago was a wonderful place, very small classes, uh, taught by leading professors. Chicago worked, and I think still does, on the principle that any newly minted PhD can teach a course in his or her specialty. But only a mature mind who's thought long about the subject can teach an introductory course. So I profited from this enormously. I went from Chicago to uh, Yale to graduate school where I worked with Carl Deutsch. Um, I did make a mistake at Yale, which was applying not to the political science department, but <laughs> to the international relations department because I was intending to do interdisciplinary studies, but didn't know that this Committee on International Relations had been set up as a way of corralling dinosaurs so the department could become more modern. Um, for various reasons, uh, I didn't get on, and ultimately I finished my PhD at the newly opened Graduate Center of the City University of New York. Uh, here too, I had a wonderful experience. My dissertation director, a political theorist, uh, Mel Richter, uh, and backed up by John Stessinger, Karl Deutsch, Ivo Dukacek in international relations, and Isaiah Berlin in political theory, oh, and John Hertz as well. And John and Ivo uh, then became my colleagues as my first post-PhD teaching appointment was at the City College of New York. And I have to say, uh, my professors were not only uh, intellectually stimulating, they were uh, open to personal contact, uh, supportive in many ways. Uh, Hans uh, Morgenthau, for example, uh, when I worked as his research assistant, uh, gave me time to go off on uh, civil rights uh, activities. So this was before, a few years before the era of freedom riders. But the civil rights movement had become active. I was part of a group of people who would regularly go down to uh, Southern Illinois to where the state legislature met. And I think it was once a week or once a month, the legislators would be at their desks and constituents could come in and chat with them about issues of interest. You can't imagine this happening today. The guards wouldn't let you in. So I would go and chat with legislators and persuade them why they should support civil rights legislation. And mind you, <laughs> the uh, in Springfield, the legislature is just down the street from Abraham Lincoln's house. So there's a certain symbolism here. They would often tell me that they had constituent pressure to oppose uh, any civil rights legislation or that they knew that their constituents uh, uh, would be uh, against it. And my argument was, I understand this, but you need to think about your legacy and most important, 10, 20 years from now, you need to be able to look your children and grandchildren in the eye. And you won't be able to do this if you supported racism and opposed civil rights because it's going to happen uh, regardless of which side you're on. But if you can tell them you were an early supporter and favored this change, uh, giving people human rights, uh, they will uh, honor you in a way they wouldn't before. Uh, I don't know if this had any effect, but I was deeply committed uh, to doing this and Hans was very supportive. Well, my first PhD, post-PhD position, as I noted, was at the City College of New York, which was a uh, very special kind of institution. 
It had been founded uh, in the middle of the 19th century as a free institution for people from any religion, color, background, class to come get an education. Uh, over the years, it developed a reputation as a poor man's Harvard. Uh, City College produced as undergraduates uh, more Nobel Prize winners than uh, either Harvard or Berkeley, perhaps even Harvard and Berkeley combined. It was initially a great place to teach uh, for this uh, reason. And I had uh, very fine colleagues, uh, among them Hans Morgenthau, John Hertz, Ivo Dukacek, and in history, people like um, Hans Cohen, who was the author of one of the great early works on uh, nationalism. I also taught at the Graduate Center as well, uh, which was uh, downtown at 42nd Street, and a nice contrast uh, to the uptown uh, City College I biked uh, between the two. In subsequent uh, decades, um, I taught at the Naval and National War Colleges, where I was professor of strategy. I spent a year in the Carter administration as a scholar in residence at the Central Intelligence Agency. This was uh, quite interesting. Uh, when I was a professor of strategy at the Naval War College uh, during the Vietnam War, Admiral Stansfield Turner was the uh, commandant. He had hired me because he knew I was an opponent of the Vietnam War. In fact, I had spent time in Vietnam as a so you could say as an anti-war activist giving talks against uh, the war. He wanted both sides presented to the students, and the students were very interesting people. Uh, they were average age 43, 44, naval captains, army, air force colonels, and their counterparts from Treasury, State, CIA. Uh, it was a worthwhile um, experience. So he hired me because I used to argue with him that the CIA greatly exaggerated Soviet strategic capabilities and that the defense industry and others, their supporters in the Congress, used these estimates to justify buying more weapons. That in fact, both sides were engaging in a kind of worst case analysis that provided the basis for further weapons, strategic and conventional, that convinced the other side that its adversary was aiming for a first strike capability. Rather than uh, buying security, they were a source of mutual insecurity. So in essence, uh, I was hired to try to make my case um, in the agency, which was a very interesting experience and worthwhile for a year. And then I went off to Europe and taught in the uh, Johns Hopkins uh, Center of the Bologna Center of Johns Hopkins University in Bologna, which is a, a lovely town in which uh, to teach. Um, my wife, Carol, uh, who had been teaching in Georgetown Law School, didn't have a position in Italy, and we both agreed we would go to where we could both get jobs. This turned out to be Cornell, uh, she in the law school, I in the government department. We were at Cornell for a number of years, an institution that I really didn't care for very much. And spent time at Ohio State University, where I was director of the Mershon Center, at the time the premier center in the U.S. for political psychology. From there I went to Dartmouth, uh, and I still have a home in Hanover, New Hampshire, from, this is where I'm sitting at the moment. Uh, Dartmouth treated both of us very well. Uh, 
I had wonderful colleagues, bright students, it's a fine institution, and it's a library where when you seek a book, you're almost certain to find it, and if they don't have it within 24 hours, it comes from another Ivy League uh, university, and uh, basically it's on your desk. I retired at the age of 70 and went uh, almost directly from my retirement dinner to a job interview at King's College, uh, London, where I have been teaching now, uh, this is my ninth year, although now I teach uh, half-time. I also have an appointment at Cambridge, uh, where I am a bi-fellow at Pembroke College. Uh, another institution that I feel uh, extremely fond about, uh, Pembroke College. I have been a visiting professor in various places uh, in Europe. In that sense, I've had uh, a very full uh, professional career. I think I have uh, gained enormously from dividing my uh, professional time in an institutional sense between Europe and the United States, having taught in Italy, Germany, Switzerland, France, visiting positions in Denmark and Sweden, as well as a visiting position in Canada and Montreal. So I'm able to see the world through the eyes of different peoples. It's given me different perspectives, not only on foreign policy, but on international relations uh, more generally uh, that find their way uh, into my work. I'm, I'm going to stop here, but <clears throat> I'm going to make this the, the first of two talks because I want to talk a little about the substance of my work and why I have approached um, international relations in the way I have. Thank you.